just want to make a few things clear. I'm an artist. I'm not a basketball player, so I'm short in real life. <laughs> That's one. And two, I want to talk to you guys, and I prepared a little speech for everybody before I came in here. And three, I'm a little bit nervous because everybody's sitting down and I'm used to people jumping. So <laughs> let's get this thing cracking. Can we get this thing cracking? Okay, hold on. Oh, hold up. Bear with me, y'all. <laughs> All right, here we go. Life. Life could be as enjoyable as a good film that you've been itching to watch. Life could be as mundane like a job you dislike a lot. And last, life can be as grim as a post-apocalyptic future with no hope in sight. Curtis Jackson, most of y'all know him as 50 Cent, said, death gotta be easy, cause life is hard. It could leave you physically, mentally, and emotionally scarred. That statement itself is often overlooked, but as we continue to breathe, that statement has proven true time and time again. I want everybody in this room to close your eyes. Okay, now I need you to imagine a punch coming at you. What do you do in that split second? Do you slip the punch? Do you avoid the altercation altogether? Do you strike back? Or do you take the punch? Now open your eyes. What did y'all see? What did y'all do? Did you slip? Did you avoid it? Did you take it or did you strike back? This is the way that life will come at you. Sometimes you avoid a punch, sometimes you have to take a punch, and sometimes you have to strike back with your own combination. Treat your life like a punch is coming at you. Because when you think life won't hit you hard, that's when it'll hit you the hardest. When you expect a punch coming, you have removed the fear of being hit. It can help you live your life to the fullest. What you're about to learn today is my struggles, not as an artist in the industry, but my struggles as a human being in life. Hopefully, what I say here will inspire you to take a different form of perspective to help you persevere through the trials and tribulations that you are currently facing in your life. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Denzel Curry, but today you will call me Professor Zeltron. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming to us today and what an incredibly open, opening speech. Um, I'd like to just start firstly by um, talking to us about what generally inspires you, as in what drives you creatively. What drives me creatively is just being the best at whatever I could possibly be good at, you know? And over the time when I first started, I wanted to be the best artist, just the best artist, period. And it didn't even come with rapping at first. It came with just physically, like actually drawing, like drawing on a piece of paper, you know, and trying to get better at doing that. And I was drawing more and more and more over time before I even picked up a pen to write poetry or to even write raps in general. So what drives me is just being the best at my craft and just being the best me I could possibly be. And the way I go about it is, you know, I got to start from somewhere. So I start off not being super good and just, you know, just trying to figure it out and just trying to push myself as much as possible. So I think that pretty much what drives me, like just things that push me to be the best person I could be. That's amazing. When you first made your first um, a musical uh, piece, you were still in high school. And of course, uh, that's a, a great time in many people's lives. You, you, you got, you got you know, prom coming up, you got all the types of uh, fun things and mischief to get off to. But making music is a difficult process, it, it's layered, it takes focus, it takes inspiration. 
Um, what was it about high school and what was it about that Nostalgia 64 that made you realise that this was a path for you and how did you cope with the competing uh, pressures of life at that point in time? Well, first off, high school sucked. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first two years I was at an art school and, you know, rapping was just a hobby to me. It wasn't like something I took serious, like how I wanted to take um, just taking art serious because if I wasn't rapping, I'd probably be a cartoonist or something or making like comic books. But um, after I got kicked out of art school, um, due to, um, I guess I could have graduated, you know, on time if I would have just, you know what I'm saying? I went to my regular school, but they didn't really want me there. Um, that's when I really took music serious because everything was just a hobby at first. Like me rapping, me making raps, me making poetry, that was all hobbies to me, you know? And I guess, me getting kicked out, I see myself as a failure and then things wasn't working out at home. You know, parents separated, my mom and my father completely separated. Brothers went to college, a couple of my brothers were in and out of jail, raising kids, that type of thing. And music was the only option. And I just felt like if I was gonna go all the way in, I wanted to go all the way in. And around that time, that's when I met like Space Goes Perp and Mike DC and all these guys that like, pretty much was in the, the beginning of the journey, you know? And that's what it was. That's amazing. Um, obviously, family is a key part of us in life, and you highlighted how you sort of like went straight into music there. Um, if you don't mind, I wonder to what degree um, you feel comfortable talking about how Trey's, his death affected your music, and perhaps who your view on the US um, state. Trayvon Martin. Um, I mean, Treon Johnson. Yeah, that, before my brother died, it was more so like um, when, Tra during the Trayvon Martin thing that was happening, it was more so when I was doing stuff like Strictly For My Raiders and being at Carrot City when everybody walked out, when they was like marching in the streets for Trayvon Martin just so they could get justice. That was like a part of history that, you know, that will always sit me, sit, <clears throat> excuse me that I'll always sit with me because I was there. I was actually there when that happened. And then when my brother died, it kind of just, everything just broke apart. And I felt it, I felt what that family was going through. And it always impacted me to talk about injustices that was happening in my community and just injustices that was happening in the world as a whole, because somebody that I know was affected by that. And it still haunts me to this day because I didn't even get a chance to say, I really love you, you know what I'm saying? Because that's my peoples. That's, that's amazing. Um, your music has obviously evolved over time it, to some people. It, it, it's an eclectic mix of um, different zones. Um, how do you think, in response to what you said right now, how do you think your, your music has evolved in relation to the racial reckoning that's happened in the US? Um, is there any relation to that from your perspective at all? Repeat the question, I'm sorry. How do you feel your music has, has evolved in relation to the racial reckoning that's happening in the US and around the world um, recently? Well. Obviously, when I started, I was really young, so I was a super immature, and I wasn't really trying to view the world. I was just trying to have fun like everybody else. Like, a lot of these kids in here, like, want to have fun with their life at, at the time, but, you know, and I was just going through phases trying to find who I am as a person or this type of person, this type of person. But as I kept growing, I, you know, just looking at society as it is, it was like so much things to talk about. And I guess over time where I felt like I didn't have things to talk about, the world was there and it had everything to talk about. So it made me want to speak on certain things that was happening in society already with police brutality, um, uh, crazy sc school shootings, things that was happening in my community where it came down to like stuff like George Floyd, Treon Johnson, Trayvon Martin. Um, also with things that was just happening in the industry, in the industry I'm in, the musical industry, you know, and how people are being pimped. I wanted to talk about it all. And that's how my views started to change. It went from me just being like, yeah, I'm doing this in my neighborhood and like anime and this and third to, okay, I still like anime, but I'm finna say anime less this time and keep going and keep going and keep going. And even paying attention to my feelings, like I felt I never paid attention to my feelings before. I would feel things and I wouldn't understand them. Now I do. So it just gave me the platform to really like, okay, I could talk about my feelings, I could talk about the world, I could just talk about everything with no holes bar. And that's how my music ended up maturing because I thought people liked a certain type of record, so I would try to chase that record, like trying to do Ultimate 20,000 times and it will never work 
trying to make Clark Cobain 20,000 times, it would never work. Everything was unique to that feeling. So that's how my things, that's how things change. I mean, that's definitely the case. I think um, uh, tracks on Melt My Eyes are not quite the same <laughs> as Ultimate. Um, and you, you really tease out this uh, theme of self-awareness and trying to um, delve into your emotions in, in, in that uh, album. Could you tell us more about uh, why you had to transition to be much more introspective with Melt My Eyes in comparison to the much more turned up or um, different types of music that you've made in the past? Let me ask you a question. How many people um, listen to my music in here? How many of y'all know me for yelling? How many of y'all know me for loud music? Be honest. How many of y'all know me for like just shouting? Okay, they ain't gonna tell you the truth. But, <laughs> well, just kidding. But listen. Um, when it came down to me making loud music like the stuff you hear on Taboo and like Ultimate and Imperial, I wanted to do something different because people already heard that already. Plus, when I was, once I finished Taboo, I planned out Melt My Eyes See Your Future. As a matter of fact, I still have the plans from when I planned it. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I could t tell you about everything that I planned out when I was doing it. Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. By the way, it was in 2018. So when I first did it, it was like September 2nd, 2018 at 6.36 p.m. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and so I wrote the title, Melt My Eyes, See Your Future. And the genres that I wanted to do was acid jazz, trip hop, R&B, jazz, boom bap, Drum and bass, jungle, funk, neo soul, dance hall, punk, and synth pop. That's how the project I wanted it to be. And topics that I wanted to um, talk about was success in music, wanting everything, losing my brother, being in a toxic relationship, being famous in mental health, my mom leaving at a, um, when I was 16, becoming a great artist, saving a friend from being homeless, a rift between me and my brother, um, living with my father, the cycle of hatred, education, sex addiction, finding love, women I did wrong, the future of Denzel Curry, politics and music, street smarts, being a role model, the old me, my religion and my relationship with God and family and friends. A lot of that stuff came into flourishing without me even noticing it because I forgot about this. That's deep. I mean, it seems that not only did you know what you wanted to do beforehand, but then naturally uh, your subconscious started producing that. Um, do you want to talk more about uh, your journey with sort of like quitting vices, as you uh, termed it? Uh, how, how, how did you find quitting smoking and, 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 and taking drugs? And what did you replace it with? I think we were speaking about this um, before on the phone a while back. OK, with quitting vices, drinking, Come on, bro, you're gonna look old by the time you're 30. Like, <laughs> that's one. Smoking weed, I don't have no problem with smoking weed, but my problem is I can't smoke weed by itself. So I would mix it with tobacco, I would spliff it, but I won't smoke a cigarette because I remember when my um, grandmother had throat cancer, they had to put the, um, the little tube in her throat and stuff like that, so she had the little hole, and that scarred me for life, so I would never smoke a cigarette by itself. So. Quitting that, I was just like, eh, I can't smoke weed without tobacco. I can't smoke tobacco without weed. I'm done with this. And after I did that, I remember somebody, I was tweeting, and somebody was like, he was like, I was saying some crazy shit. And somebody was like, what are you smoking? And I was like, ha, I'm sober. And then I was like, wait a minute. Why am I about to lie? <laughs> Why, do, why don't I just be sober? It just hit me. It's just like, why don't I just be sober? Because if I go and smoke weed now, it's like this tweet is meaningless. So I just stopped. And then the first thing that came to my mind was, well, my life's going to be boring. So what do I do to not make it boring? So I ended up going into martial arts and been doing it ever since. Do you want to tell us more about your journey with Muay Thai? Hell yeah. I got, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, with that, when I stopped smoking weed and I stopped doing a lot of light stuff, you know, I still have vices, don't get me wrong, I'm not a perfect person, I still have vices. But when it came down to the martial arts of, you know, just doing it, I just went in and I was thinking like, okay, I'm gonna do this and this is what I'm gonna do, this is gonna be my thing, this is gonna be my, new, my hobby. Because when I was growing up in Miami, my brother Treon, 
he's also a backyard fighter. Most people don't know that. It was a movie he was in called um, Dogfight. And if anybody know who Kembo Slice is, you could go on YouTube and like look it up, look up his fights. Um, my brother was in those backyards fighting and stuff like that. So it always had something, like I was always with him. And that always stayed with me from when I was like a boy to when I grew up. And so that's what made me go into martial arts besides the vices and like take it serious. And I remember when I had all the nose rings and stuff like that, I took them out because I really wanted to take it serious. And my journey from that, I remember I would get super good and then my manager would be like, hey, we're on tour. For how long? Six months. I'll be like, yeah. So I have to tell my um, coach and be like, hey, I won't be back. I'm going to be going from this time to this time. But when I come back on the train, the first time I told him that, he thought I wasn't going to come back. I came back and I was like, what I miss? He was like, oh, we're only doing a one-two combination in the kick. And I was like, okay, cool. So I would get good at that, be in there for like almost three weeks, four weeks. And then I would have to go back on tour again, be gone for a month. Or come back, do the same thing, same process, be gone for two weeks. Same process, be gone for a day. Same process, be gone for um, 10 weeks. And it would just happens for years to years. And then when I hit quarantine, where I was working on the album and things like that, um, I started to really hone in on myself during the martial arts. And I would see myself get crazy good throughout those two years. I was like, just in there, just been kicking people and shit. Like, <laughs> Wow. Um, so with your journey with martial arts, could you tell us more about how that's impacted your sort of personal life, but also more specifically uh, benefits that might have been through your mental health and, and, and your personal growth? Well, with mental health, man, it gave me an outlet so I could channel all that. You okay? <laughs> <laughs> you sure, though? You want some water? No, I'm going to go. You okay? All right. All right. Just take the water, man. Come on. <laughs> it's okay, bro. <laughs> okay. So the way martial arts impacted me, it was like mainly controlling of the ego. Like when I went in there, I had an ego because, you know, you're sparring all these people and, you know, it's not about winning or losing when you're sparring, you know? It's about learning at the end of the day. Same way you could do with anything. It's all about learning. And sometimes they encourage you to get your ass whooped because that's how you learn, you know? And just how it helped me with my personal life, it was, I was doing therapy and I was doing martial arts at the same time. And he was telling me the exact same thing when it came down to ego, when it came down to being more sensitive, you know what I'm saying? Or considerate of your partner, things of that nature. And even with things like, all right, you're sparring somebody. And in my industry, it's very competitive as a musician. So when it came down to um, sparring classes, they would say, don't focus on what the other guy's throwing. Just focus on what you're gonna throw next. It just, it's like, it's not even about him. It's about what you're going it's like, it should be, feel like a conversation. It should never feel like an argument. So I will always worry about what I'm gonna throw. Doesn't matter what he's gonna throw, he's gonna throw whatever but it should matter what I'm going to throw on, how I'm going to block and what I'm going to do, how I'm going to get out the way. Um, it's basically my answer to things, but just mainly focusing on me. That's how it, um, and then I translated that into me making music because I was always focused on what the next artist got, what he has. He has this car, he has this feature, he's on this billboard, he's at this number. And I was worried about them, worried about them, worried about them. It almost to a point where I was jealous or like I hated the fact that they had that position and I don't and I know I've been working hard enough but it just came to my mind like hey focus on what you're gonna do because either way it go it's about you this is your life right now so that's how I, that's what I learned from there and knowing when to hit knowing when to strike it's all about timing that's why I realized a lot of things end up hitting on time because it's all about timing and especially in fights it's all about timing Make one mistake and you're done, you know? Not even a mistake or bad choice. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that kind of like leads into like life in, especially with independent musical artists in America. I, I wonder whether uh, you'd like to reflect on perhaps um, who are one of the most inspiring artists or musicians that you've either lived with or worked with in the past uh, couple of years or projects. Is there anybody you want to talk about? Triple X, maybe, or anyone else. <laughs> There's a lot of people, so I knew uh, they was gonna bring this up, okay. But when I was working on 
Imperial, I had this house. And in this house, it was myself, two of my own close friends from childhood. Their name is Shane and Seamus. Ronnie J, he produced Ultimate, he produced Threats, he produced the majority of um, Imperial. And you know, songs like Seventeen, Your Hood, and like that Christmas project that X came out with, Ronnie J did that as well. Um, and at this house, you know, we was making all the stuff. 12 Win was living there as well, my DJ, for a brief moment in time. This guy named Freebase was living there for a brief moment in time. And people like Smoke Perp and Lil Pump would pull up to the house too and make their early music there as well with Ronnie because Ronnie was the one finding them. Ski Mask will also come to the house and work together. That's where we made Space Goes Pussy. And um, yeah, that's where all the early stuff was made. Ultimate was made in that house as well. One of my biggest songs was made in that house. So, um, and just working at that time, you know, it was just me and Ronnie at the time. And Ronnie was couch hopping from going from place to place, different houses. And he would always be at my house and we would always make beats and you know, I would rap on them. And then one day I was just like, Yo, you don't got a couch hop. You could just stay at my house. Don't worry about the rent. Anybody that has a room in the house will worry about the rent. Just worry about like shit like lights and water, like which we all gonna pay together. And ended up staying, making beats there and started making Imperial. And throughout that time, it was like late 2015. Um, I threw a house party and X and Ski shows up. I had met Ski years before. But at that night, that was the first time I met X because he came with Ski. Ski thought he was supposed to perform at my house and I'm drunk and I'm like, who told you that? Like, I thought it was some guy that told him that, hey, you could perform at my house because this is Denzel Curry's crib and stuff like that. So they came in, I confronted somebody. Really, a girl told them to come. They was like, no, I told them to slide this down third. And they was like, so do we have to leave? And I was like, nah, y'all good, y'all can chill. And then, Next thing you know, a friend of mine, his name's Chief, he, um, he left. I remember he went to this thing called CD4 and he seen X perform live and then he came to my house the next day, like, bruh, I went to CD4 the second day and it was this kid and he was going off and you know him. And I'm like, I know him. I'm like, who do I know? Like, I don't know who you're talking about. And he's like, you know him, you know this kid. Like, you know him, he came to the crib. I'm like, nah, he, no, you know, I was like, I would know who came to my house, bro. He's like, no, him and his dog came to, came to the house. Matter of fact, I'm gonna show you a picture. He showed me a picture and it was X. And I was just like, eh, I don't remember him. And then I just remember seeing Ski a lot. I will always see Ski wherever I was going. I was always seeing him. And um, I just remember running into them at a Kodak Black show. Like it was like when early Kodak Black stuff. We went to a Kodak Black show in Wynwood. And I ran to him, I was like, hey, you came to my house. He was like, yeah, you came to, yeah, we came to your crib, this and the third. And me and him was talking and I was like, yo, you gotta come to the crib, I love your music. Cause it was like a song called Fuck and a song called I Love It When They Run. And I Love It When They Run, I would run that back so many times cause that was my favorite song. When I tell you I like some shit, I'm not gonna sit there and lie to you, you know? And then I was like, yo, we gotta link up. We, gotta, um, we got some things to talk about. He was like, hey, I'm going to Denver. And then when I come back, I'm gonna um, fuck with you. He came back, we got to the chase, we wanted him part of ULT, and he was just like, I don't know you, so is this a friendship or a business um, partnership? And I was just like, hey man, I can't do business if we ain't cool, you feel me? So we ended up working together, and then that's how all them songs started to come about, like Sippin' Teen Yo Hood, and him meeting Ronnie J, and them making what they make, and it just was a thing. And then I remember I was shooting the cover for Imperial, right, and I remember um, Ski came, cause he was on, Ski's on the cover by the way, he's on the cover of Imperial. And um, X came later, but X got into some trouble. So I remember, um, I remember what he got in trouble for. He like stabbed somebody or some, something crazy. He was like pulled out a knife on someone and police was looking for him. Some crazy shit like that. I was like 20, 21 around the time when that happened. and. I was like, stay at my crib, lay low for a while, just chill. And next thing you know, you know, we was staying there. I moved out. He ended up moving to this guy named Bruno's crib, and that was the end of that. But we still kept in touch from then, riffs and everything. And but pretty much, that's just a story of the ULT house. The ULT house pretty much was a staple for a lot of like Florida artists that came there. A lot of people passed there, 
And um, even Earl Sweatshirt came to the ULT house a long time ago. I met my current girl at the ULT house years before she became my girlfriend. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> I'm, also, I'm almost tempted to go to delve deeper into that, but um, we're just gonna open up to open audience questions. Um, I want to talk more about, uh, you, obviously if you like something, you won't lie about it. I wonder whether you listen to UK music and do you yeah. like what you hear? Of course I listen to is UK there, music. Is there, is there any uh, hip hop or gram artist that maybe come to mind that you really um, enjoy? I love Georgia Smith. I like Mahalia. I like, uh, who else do I like? Slow Tie, of course. Um, Questy Darko. Boy Better Know, you know, JME, Skepta, Wiley, I like them. Because I will always watch Lords of the Mic. Like, especially when Skepta was battling Devil Man, that's one of my favorite battles. Um, yeah, you probably didn't know I knew all that, huh? Um, what else? LD, you know, with the mask, I like him. Um, six, seven, gigs, just to name a few. So I do listen to UK music, heavy. I mean, I was going to ask how is the UK scene impacting uh, the US, but I don't Obvious. to ask. <laughs> Obviously, like, I heard a 6, 7 and LD first, and then when Pop Smoke started doing it, I was like, man, I was on this before anybody else was. <laughs> like, I was like, come on. And then I see Rocky working with Skepta, and I'm just thinking to myself about all them times, like from 20... 13, 2014, when my homie Freebase and Lofty, they would come from Europe, they would come from over here and come back home. And that's why I got different sounds and like, why I like different sound of music, because they would always come back and play us some different shit. Like, I remember when they went to Paris and then they came back and played this dude named Karis. And then he had a um, song called Charger. They went to London and he was like, hey yo, you should listen to this. And then it was LD and 6, 7, and it was just like all them, all them drill beats that you hear nowadays, I was hearing it from six, seven first. And it blew my mind. So, and I would just always watch UK drill videos and stuff like that. Oh, that's incredible. Um, I'm keen to uh, open up the floor for questioning now. I know there's many people who have burning questions to ask. Uh, so if you have a question, please raise up your hand and then a mic will be brought to you. I recognize the very keen member with the unfortunate football top. Yo, um, thank you, Dezo. Could you stand talk. up, please? Thank you for your talk. Um, I wanted to, to point out, like, I think what differentiates you between other artists in the game is just how consistent you are in terms of, like, releasing albums. So I want to know, how do you maintain that consistency um, yeah, throughout your music? That's a hard one, you know. Um, I just have fun with it, I guess. You know, just go off the feeling majority of the time and just make sure whatever I'm making and how I package it, it has to make sense. And I just continue and just doing it. You know, I got a lot to say, so. Thank you. Uh, I recognize the member with a white top right there. Professor Zoltron, thank you very much for yeah. <laughs> the interview. Um, the, your recent album, um, Melt My Eyes, you talk about like, a, a, like rough periods in your life and like reflecting on those moments. Um, and I was wondering, in those tough times, do you find that you use it to like fuel your creative process or do you like hit a block? And then if you do hit a block, how do you like overcome that and then you know, go forward? Well, I use it as fuel because a lot of the things that I've endured, like, I look back at it and I just like, you know, let me see what's going on in that situation. And then when I see it over and over again, I have no choice but to talk about it. So I guess it does fuel me in a way, the same way how it'll fuel Mike Tyson in a fight, you know? So I think when it comes down to that, I just let my past fuel whatever is going to happen and drive me to have a better future because I know where I came from. Thank you. Uh, I see the member with an orange top right there. Uh, thank you for speaking, Zell. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, so we talked a little bit about how you went viral really early in your career with uh, Ultimate. And it's kind of weird thing through with like the water bottle flips and stuff like that. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, like, were you prepared um, for like the mainstream popularity of that song? And like, how did you deal with that really early in your career? Hell no. 
And um, how I dealt with it, I tried to follow it up and it just wasn't working. So I just followed it up with some, you know, like Imperial. I just followed it up with an album because the tape that it was on, people didn't really like it that much. So I just used that failure and to drive me to um, making something like that. And room, I think I was telling certain people like certain um, songs on certain albums were hints to how the next album was going to sound. So I used the ultimate and just use ULT and stuff like that and just use the momentum of that and then use that sound itself to create Imperial. Thank you. Uh, recognize the member with the blue top here on the front row. Um, th there seems to be a bit of an issue in hip hop at the moment where a lot of rappers are dying very young, be it through um, drugs or crime or anything, um, to the extent that articles are getting posted and people's response are, you know, oh, another rapper's passed away. Um, I wondered if, as, as an artist, you have any insight into maybe how this can be prevented, um, whether there needs to be a cultural shift in hip hop or... or effectively like why this is happening only in hip-hop and how we can solve that i mean i think it's pretty much the lifestyle that comes with it because the majority of the people that's like doing it you know what I'm saying that's dying this young and stuff like that maybe they have the mentality of not leaving their environment that wasn't particularly good for them in the first place or it's hard for them to leave that environment because that's all they know you know even when they have money and success but the person who they are to the core is that you know what I'm saying? Money doesn't change people. It amplifies who they already were. You know what I mean? So it's unfortunate that a lot of rappers are dying in their own areas because most majority of the time they do die in the places they live in. You know, trying to escape that environment, you know, you got to separate, okay, this is my old life and this is where I'm currently headed. And I guess they don't see the lines because, you know, maybe it's not happening for them. Maybe it's just like they're just so used to it and so deep into it that it's kind of hard to make that shift, you know? And it's just weird because that's how they are, you know? Um, I think a way that people could just move away from that, maybe, you know, because in the black community is like, no therapy, nobody preaches therapy or like getting help or like understanding traumas and underlining things like that or like even people who are trying to help. I think they should separate themselves and then try to figure out what's wrong with them and then maybe if they figure out that, they could go in and do their thing and you'll probably have less murders. And sometimes you got people on the internet and fans and rap fans perpetuating the violence that's happening. And even in the industry where all you hear on the radio is the same thing and the same topic, the same subject matter, I'm smoking on this person, I'm doing this person. They want that because it's exciting to people. You see it and you consume it and then you think like, oh, this is how it is, what it is, and that's how it is. So majority of the time, people push it. It's not like they want to just be there. Like, majority of the time, people push that upon people, you know? you know? How many, you know, records do you really hear on the radio where they're saying something, like, really positive, like going to college or something? Like, I'm being serious. You know, like, I listen, there's, like, how many songs are, like, are like oh, I'm at the club, I'm with this, uh, I just smashed this person, oh, I just, I'm smoking on this person, I'm doing all of this. So. It's not really the artist, it's really the industry they're in that's pushing it as well. You gotta look at it like that from that perspective. Yeah, just a quick um, follow up on that. Um, Cause you sort of highlighted something very important there. And one of my questions was to talk about responsibilities for these artists who are usually quite very young and, and as you highlighted probably have um, environments that won't be conducive for um, the most healthy um, um, habits or safe environments. But the labels, the old guards, those who are around them make a lot of money um, from these young people. And of course, the, the content of the music is a driver of that. Do you think there's any responsibility or perhaps duty of care from labels themselves and um, uh, industry um, icons who benefit monetarily from um, young artists to ensure their safety, to ensure they um, encourage or at least prevent them from um, getting help. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Mm. Their duty of care to those who basically benefit from um, their lifestyle. Well, 
I, it's very it's very fucked up because you know they are being exploited at the end of the day but they know that's what sells you know what i'm saying sex drugs and money it sells it always sells if you ain't watching a movie, you know if you ain't watching a romantic comedy or something like that and you want to watch a, something that's good it's like sex money and drugs like most people are like perpetuated with that because we live in sin like it is what it is so they're gonna profit off that and they're gonna use whoever they use to profit off that make money off that and it's fucked up they don't want it gets to a point where it makes too much money to a point where if you get help it might mess that up there's an article i think um there's something like i think uh, Man, it was on the tip of my tongue. It was about um, Jim Carrey. It's like somewhat related. I remember, I think Jim Carrey said he didn't want to get therapy because it'll take away from his funny. You know, it'll take away from him being like funny because he just, you know, unwrapped everything. Imagine if a rapper that was like living hardcore gets therapy. It would be totally different. You know what I mean? Like the music would sound totally different. And I know because I know it from firsthand because when I started going to therapy, my music started to sound different. And I started to articulate my feelings better. You know, maybe they'll look at everything and all their traumas and everything that they've been through and then they start piecing everything together and now they have become a different person. The industry would never want that. You know, because whatever they was doing already is making money and perpetuating a certain agenda. But that's all I could say about that. Oh, wow. So it seems that like artists are stuck in that Cash 22 case the incentives around them is not to help them, it's to allow them to consume themselves, sort of. Yeah, it'll give you everything you want. You know what I'm saying? It'll give you everything you want for you to not realize what's actually happening. Thank you. Um, I red. recognize... Red. The, <laughs> a member of the red top. Oh my gosh. I hope I answer your question. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for coming down here from London. Uh, I hope the concerts go well over the next few days. So it's, it's really nice for you to come down. I had a few questions. I'm going to boil it down to one. All the stuff you're saying about ter therapy really makes me connect to Kendrick Lamar, obviously. As you know, the recent album is really about him going to therapy. But I'm not going to ask a question about that album. Because there are a number of masterpieces in his discography. And I'm thinking of To Pippa Butterfly. And on that album, he makes a song where he, he, he does this sort of fictional interview with a late rapper, Tupac. Right. So I wanted to ask you the question, if you could do an interview with a, with a, with a rapper who's passed away, who would it be DMX. what would you ask them? It will be DMX. And what would you ask them? Man, it'll be, that's actually hard to say. I met DMX before he, he passed, but... Um, I don't know how many questions I would actually have for him, you know. Just, you know, I don't know. That, that's actually a question that I'm really stumped at. Yes, it will be DMX. I would want to talk to him, but I would not know what to ask him. I never thought of me asking him anything, to be honest. I just think that we'll probably have, a, you know, probably a conversation about lifestyles and hardships, but not really on how to deal with it, I think we'll have solutions for each other, I guess. Or like, probably answers that we both gotta figure out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I recognize the member with the cardigan. <laughs> and I meant questions, my bad. I said answers we gotta figure out, questions we gotta figure out. Good evening. First of all, apologies, we're gonna go, for, we're gonna go off on a little tangent from your um, opinion as, as an artist, so obviously you have a good knowledge of comic books, so this is going to be almost like an essay question, but it's a big question. Oh, here we do go. You like, do, you like the Marvel uni the, do you like the Marvel Cinematic Universe and or do you like the Star Wars Cinematic Universe? So, for example, are you watching the Obi-Wan series at the moment? You talking about the Obi-Wan series? I'm waiting to go back home to watch it, oh, but okay. I've so been watching The Mandalorian and I've been watching Boba Fett, so those two have been good. And Visions, have you seen um, Star Wars yes, Visions? Yes, 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 Visions. I love that it's like the Akira uh, Kurosawa kind of the feeling, so it's brilliant. I love yeah. those. That shit was and, dope. Uh, what's, your favorite Marvel, what's your favorite Marvel film? For example, Doctor Strange 2 or whatever. You know, I wanted to see Doctor Strange 2 today, but I had to do this shit. <laughs> 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 yeah. But um, let me tell you, um, when it comes down to, uh, I think out of my favorite Marvel movies, 
It's out of Wolverine, Logan, Deadpool. Point okay. And you're going to watch Doctor Strange 2 and then have an opinion. Okay. Yeah, I got to wait for that. Thank they you. already spoiled um, Spider-Man for me. Like, I seen Tobey Maguire. Like, you know, they spoiled that for me. What? Tobey Maguire? What? Huh? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's a sea biscuit. Like, like Toby McGuire is a sea biscuit. I didn't tell you anything. Mm. But um, I think um, just going off of what you were saying, I prefer both of them. But I'm more of a Star Wars fan. I am a nerd for that shit. Like, not Star Trek. It's just a bunch of people sitting down on FaceTime. That's it. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? Patrick Stewart. His whole career is based off sitting down. You see, he, he, he was Professor X. He was in American Dad. I'm pretty sure he's sitting down in the booth. Um, and also, like, he's sitting down in Star Trek. There's never been a time where I've seen him stand up. Every time I turn to um, Sci-Fi Channel, he's just like, yeah, we're going to make this destination over here. You know, like, his whole career is based off sitting down. I've never seen him stand up, ever. I actually thought he was paraplegic. I did not know. <laughs> In 2013, Patrick Stewart came to Oxford Union. In fact, he's a regular guest, so he, he was actually standing where you're sitting at the moment. He's standing where I was sitting? Yes. So he wasn't sitting. <laughs> no, no, no. See? But there you go. Nine years ago, nine years ago, he, he was standing. He sat so much, he had to stand. Like. <laughs> Thank you very much for that question. Uh, a quick, a quick, quick follow-up, since, you know, we, we spoke about your interest in comics and anime and... Um, is, would you have an interest, perhaps, in going to go into the acting industry? And if you were to do so, what universe would you join? I mean, I'm thinking of the power universe personally, but obviously you have different interests. Well, there's a lot of different interests, man. Um, I want to, you know, I've seen this movie of uh, Dune. Like, I've seen that. I wouldn't mind being a part of that universe as a Fremen. Like, I would just want to wear the suit and just be in the desert and just be a Fremen. Star Wars, of course I want to be a Star Wars, but I want to be a Mandalorian. Like, I just want to have the helmet and stuff like that and do the, you know what I'm saying? Or a Stormtrooper, because I could just die and just never do it again. <laughs> or, you know, because I'll probably be like too, too eager to be a Jedi. I'd be like, <laughs> you know? But yeah, I would definitely love to get into acting and stuff like that. I would love to act in like dramas. But I don't want to do a drama that is just going to be like, oh, the typical drama where, oh, he was a drug dealer and, oh, he was a basketball player with aspirations and stuff like that. I don't want to do those type of dramas. You know what I'm saying? I want to do stuff that's like, that you rarely see people of color in, you know, what you rarely see it so it could break the, just break the mold. Um, things like Dune, uh, Star Wars, of course. Um, was a, a Christopher Nolan movie. I love his movies. Martin Scorsese, I would love to be a part of those kind of movies, you know? Um, and uh, even like filming stuff, filming like good movies, cause I, or filming shows and doing them the right way. I would love to be just a part of the, just being in a director's chair of things because with certain things, I feel like we could all have dope ass movies off of the stuff we grew up on. Like I've seen the recent Power Rangers and it's terrible. <laughs> and I'm like, bruh, I know where, like, I know how to make it to where it could look good and it could make, make it look gangster. But all that CGI and stuff, that's not it. Because when we was watching Power Rangers coming up, it was just, it was just fire because they was actually doing it, you know? But I want to direct stuff like that. I want to direct actual, be the first person to actually do a live action anime and make it look good because Cowboy Bebop was terrible. Not the, not the anime, the, the live version, it's terrible. Don't watch it. If you're watching it, stop it. If you say it's just as good, go to hell. You know, you know. but I'm more so into like the whole film. Like, I think I could see what other people don't see because most, most of the time, it just be like a money grab to some people when it comes down to that. I don't mind acting. I'm scared to act because there's already a Denzel in acting and I just have to live, I have to, I have to follow that up. Like, I have to change my, like, I told, I told um, my manager, I was like, yo, if I get into acting, I'm changing my name. My name will not be Denzel Curry. It will just be Zell Curry or D Curry, like, or just Curry. Matter of fact, just Zell. That's like, that's, just mark me as Zell or Griswold Gilliams. I don't just, I don't know what you're going to name me. Just, just do that, you know? 
but definitely would be looking forward to getting into acting and voice acting. That's amazing. Um, looking for another member to ask a question. I recognise the member whose hands on the second row. Yeah, you. Just wait for the mic to be brought to you. That's the member. Uh, hi. You said you used to do art and you went to art school, right? So I was just wondering, who's your favourite artist? And I also wanted to ask, who's your favourite anime character? Favorite anime character is out of is out of um Kenshiro from Fist of the North Star, Spike Spiegel, Abito Uchiha, and and ooh, and Trunks from Dragon Ball Z. When it comes down to my favorite artists, I like um Frank Miller. You, are you familiar who Frank Miller is? Mm -mm, he no. did um Batman Year One. He also did uh this comic book called Ronin and Ronin was pretty much the um, inspiration behind Samurai Jack and he also did Sin City and um, 300 as well. So when you went to art school like what kind of art did you make? What kind of art? I mean when I went to art school it was just pretty much you had to do portraits you know like looking at the bananas and the grapes and all that shit. I had to do watercolors and all that stuff. I could do all that. It's just um, I got, before I could even like see my full potential, they kicked me out of um, art school. So I didn't really get the chance to like do it for real, for real. But I've been drawing my whole life. But the, what I draw now is more so comic book stuff, like just things that interest me. Like, you know, I like drawing characters. I like drawing myself a lot because I like to see like, okay, this is how I look currently, how I want to look. And that's how I envision myself. I would draw myself out physically, you know? And also I would, um, I've been working on this uh, comic book throughout quarantine. I've made three volumes of it and I'm finishing the fourth volume right now. So it's just been a lot. I was working on that and the album at the same time. So when I was, um, when I had writer's block, I would just say, you know what? Fuck going to the studio, I'm just gonna draw. And I would literally draw, I would put on um, uh, documentaries about like different artists and the way they came up, like Jack Kirby. He's also one of my favorites, um, Todd McFarlane, which, if you guys know who Todd McFarlane is, he's uh, he created Spawn. You, do y'all know who Spawn is? Okay. So, he created Spawn, and he's the reason why, like, Spider-Man went from looking like this to this. Like, you know what I'm saying? And he made Venom, by the way. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I recognize the member with a bright yellow top on the press bench. Oh, that's Ari, not yellow, sorry. Thanks. Um, hi, thank you so much for the talk. It was really good. Um, I have a question about, like, there's been a lot of stuff recently about artists and technology and, like, the internet and how it's kind of like especially TikTok, there's like this massive pressure from record labels. And I was wondering how you have like found the internet, like do you feel like it's helpful as an artist or do you feel like it kind of inhibits creativity? No, it's very helpful as an artist. And you know, it could help an artist by like, if you want to find inspiration that you never heard before, you can always go down a rabbit hole of things where you want to find an interest and then they'll show you what influenced that and what influenced that and what influenced that. But as in pressure from the labels and doing TikTok, that is very true. They do pressure artists into doing a TikTok and they said, hey, yo, we can't. Sometimes it be to a point like if you don't have a viral song on TikTok, they will not sign you. Like sometimes I heard about it. I didn't know it was real or not. You know, if your song ain't going viral on TikTok, I don't know what to do. And all of this stemmed from way back in the day from when Vine was out. Vine was making things go viral because it was just the same format, you know? And, and I, feel like the, you know, I feel like the internet could be very useful and it can be very helpful, but also it could be very detrimental if you spend so much time on it and not in real life with people that you could actually connect with. It's almost like you're walking unplugged. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I recognize a member on the front row there with a the blue top. Hi, thank you again for coming. Um, this is kind of a follow-up question about your art education. Uh, I'm wondering how your background in art has manifested in your creative process for making music. Hmm. 
Well, when I made my first album, I drew the cover. When I made 320 Planet Shrooms, like me and a friend, a friend of mine from Miami, his name's Astro, um, me and him sat down and actually made the um, cover for that as well. Same with the cover for Ultimate. Everything that, was, that I did with my albums have always been art driven. The cover for Imperial, I drew that first and I came up with a PowerPoint plan of how I was going to construct everything. Taboo, I had this idea of like making three um, versions of that cover years ago of what my face on it and I was going to use it for Imperial and we was drawing that out. However, it never came into flourishing for Imperial, but it manifested itself for Taboo. When it came down to like stuff like Zoo, Zoo was easy. It was just getting all the Miami shit put in a one swag and they, that's what it was. Unlocked, I remember um, drawing the um, photo, sent it to my manager of like this character where he had the hoodie with no face and everything, because I was really inspired by Wu-Tang Clan and their video on the mystery of the chess and boxing. So majority of the stuff I drew out first. And when it came down to, um, uh, melt my eyes see your future that was influenced by blue note like the artwork covers of blue note and like japanese um gundam wing um fonts and that's how that came together so art has always been a part of the process me drawing things out was always a part of the process even drawing myself out like i told this young lady earlier how i manifest how i look i drew myself out during through the era of when i was working on um Imperial, and when I was working on um, Taboo, I wanted to see how I could change physically. So I had to draw it out first to see what I, what I think looked cool and what I didn't think looked cool. So that's why I had like the blonde tips, the nose rings and all that crazy shit. That's really cool, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, I've got time for about two more questions. I recognize uh, the member with... Him. No, him. Okay. Yeah, that guy. No, no, him, right here. On the front row. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you speak very openly about things that you, you know, describe as failures, and obviously to have put out as much music as you have, I'm sure you've had to deal with negativity and just sort of brush that off. And I'm wondering if you've sort of gotten over feeling self-doubt at this point, or if that's changed through your career, or if, there's, if that still plays any role when you're about to put something new out. That would never change. I'm always doubting myself. I always doubt that something's good. I always doubt that I have the skills, I have the capability, but that's what keeps me on my toes when it comes down to actually making the art. Because if I, for a split second, be like, I'm good, I'm just as good as everybody, this, that, and the third, like, you know what I'm saying? I will become lazy. And once I become lazy, the art will um, suffer. So I always doubt myself, no matter what. And it doesn't change regardless of what is critically acclaimed, what's big and what's not. I always want to be like, okay, how can I elevate this? Because I always see like, if I don't think this way, I will fail. That's how I am. Thank you. Um, the member next to you, quickly. Um, thank you. Um, I just had a question. So like, if we put you on Ox right now, what song would you play and why? What song would I play and why? Hmm. The first song that came to my mind was Ecology by, um, by Marvin Gaye. It's a beautiful song. Just because it's a beautiful song? It's a very it? beautiful song. And the way the outro is, it's just, it's good. And he was talking about things that was currently happening in the world at that moment in time that wasn't really heard on on record before. Thank you. Um, Last question from the member with the black top on the third row. Um, thank you so much, Sal. Um, a little while ago, you said that you were going to make a boy band with Slow Tie, Zinakami, and JPEG Mafia. Um, can we still look forward to something like that happening? It's a man band. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because um, actually, I was talking to Zilla not too long ago. I got to check in on Ty. Um, JPEG, I've seen this man for two years straight. It's, it's, he pretty much on the same page. And you know, and when we first was um, going to do the idea, like, Slow Ty was the one who presented it. Slow Ty was like, it got to be me, JPEG, Travis Barker, and Denzel Curry. And I was like, I'll do it if Zilla joins too. And Zilla was like, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the member on the edge of the fourth row seemed very keen earlier on. Would you like to ask the last question? <laughs> um, 
I have more like a music industry advice um, question. If you're like in an early stage of your career and looking to get picked up. up? Okay. Oh, sorry. It's kind of. Yeah. Um, if you're in an early stage of your career and looking to like get picked up by labels with your band, but receiving offers for solo work by label and managers, like what do you do? I know you're indie, but like if you were in like scenario like that, mm. how'd you approach it? I would probably cultivate first, just like make it, make my music as a high demand. The way, don't approach your music like a musician. Approach it like a drug dealer. If you know your shit is dope, people are gonna come, people are gonna fiend for it, and they're gonna want more. The more people that want it, the more you cultivate, and then you just travel in and just start selling dope everywhere else around the motherfucking world. And I mean that in music, I don't mean it as in like selling, don't do drugs, don't sell drugs. <laughs> um, I mean it as approach it in that sense of mentality of like as a drug dealer, like if you know your shit is hot, then start marketing it the best way you can. Once you build that base, then you know, wait for the labels to come to you. That way you have ball in your court. And especially if you have like a hit or something, then ball is really in your court. Because what can you do that, what can they do that you wasn't already doing for yourself? Thank you. You're welcome. Sweet. Um, so that's all we have time for. Uh, one thing we've been asking a lot of our guests uh, this term, given this exam season, so many people are, you know, young people who have big aspirations in life and are still hopeful of to achieve big things. In one or two sentences, could you sum up an inspirational um, advice that you give to our audience members and members who are watching on Zoom right now? You know, if, I think one thing that stuck with me, uh, a friend of mine told me, he was like, most people, um, don't know why they ain't advancing in life because they simply was not picking up the phone. And I don't mean that in a way of like picking up the phone as in, oh, your friend calling, you need to pick up the phone. I mean, in like when God, if God's not calling you, you, you shouldn't be calling over and over. Don't even, you know, you know, put down the phone because another call is gonna come and maybe that's the call you need to pick up because that's gonna guide you to where you need to be. You know, whatever's not working for you at the time, put it down because some another opportunity is going to present itself and you probably won't even realize it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure. Would you all join me in thanking um, Denzel for joining us this evening? <laughs> <laughs>